Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming in. Um, as an FYI, this is being recorded just so we can share with people that couldn't make it for this lunch hour or in Stephen's case, um, 8 a.m. Um, but this is a uh, popcorn question session. So, Donald, I know you've been on here before. Um, this is an opportunity for you to ask the specific questions you have and solicit Dr. Kemble's expertise. So, Judy and Donald, if you have anything you want to know from him, now is the time to ask. Okay, um, well, I just uh, today received a message back from the Pennsylvania. So Donald and I are both in Pennsylvania. He's a medical student and I am a retired physician. And I submitted uh, a resolution to uh, ask the, to, it was the negative resolution to remove the opposition to single payer from Pennsylvania because we have to do that first. I submitted, yeah. well, I, I sent it, I'm not a delegate, I sent it to the women's medical section um, and Donald has done a lot more research on it. He kind of gave me that tip. And I did finally hear back after about a week from the woman who's, I think the chair of that section and also a delegate uh, that they had looked at it at their subcommittee meeting and. Um, they were not interested in supporting it, but I could have some other delegates submit it if I wanted to. So, um, I mean, obviously I kind of like naively just uh, bulldozed ahead and said, all right, I'll submit this resolution, even though I have no standing in the society. Yeah. Um, and um, knowing that the student section, I mean, as Donald can tell you, has already uh, agreed to support his resolution. So I don't know if you have any other uh, yes, my, my comment about that is I started out in exactly the same place where I submitted a resolution with really no expectations at all. This is back in 2008. Hawaii Medical Association at the time had had a string of about a decade of strongly Republican presidents um, and to the point that a lot of the more progressive membership quit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I submitted a resolution and I was asked to defend it before the Hawaii Medical Association Council, um, which I did. And then to my amazement, they adopted it. Wow. I didn't expect that at all. Right um, off the and, bat, the very first time? Yes. And um, <laughs> I had been a member for, you know, well, I moved back to Hawaii in 1985 and been a member ever since I started practice there. And, um, but I'd never been involved with leadership. I was on a couple of committees uh, like peer review, but that was it. Uh, and that kind of launched me into HMA leadership. I got my arm twisted to run for office. I became treasurer and then president of HMA within a couple of years. Mm. Uh, so it all sort of snowballed from there. And one thing that surprised me is that some of my strongest support came from a few Republican procedural specialists, you know, cardiologists and ophthalmologists who recognized that their fees were being controlled by the insurance companies anyway, and standardizing them with a single payer system wouldn't be much different than what they were already experiencing, but they would get their professional autonomy back from the mm -hmm. insurance companies. And they were therefore willing to support it uh, on that basis. And that also was not something I expected. And, you know, this would play out differently in every state, but it just seemed very fluky, but it, it happened that way. So was your resolution from the from the start a resolution to support single payer? You, you didn't have to dismantle an opposition first? I don't think there is anything in our state bylaws about single payer, so I didn't have to dismantle, dismantle anything at the state level. I know there is AMA opposition and, right. and when my we when it passed in Hawaii and was forwarded to the Western region it got shot down there. Uh, so it, of course never became official AMA policy, but we did endorse it at the state level. Hmm. Donald, have any other thoughts? Um, yeah, so kind of like Judy said, um, I submitted my resolution to remove um, opposition to single payer healthcare through the medical student section. And that was just um, approved. And so now I have submitted it to the, the, the like state level 
um, on delegation, and it'll be it'll be brought up for a vote in in October. Um, and yeah, I don't I don't know. I I guess I'm not like super optimistic now, hearing that uh, uh, the women's section uh, failed to endorse it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where, where to go from here. I guess try to come up with some some good testimony for, for people to bring up at the meeting if they even allow testimony this year, they didn't last year. One thing I would emphasize is that all the surveys show that at least half of US physicians support single payer. And, and uh, this your resolution is not saying we endorse single payer, it's removing the opposition. And, when, when you're trying to represent all physicians and more than half support single payer, it seems crazy to maintain that in your bylaws. It just discourages membership. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I don't know, Donald, that, that the section that contains the line about opposition to single payer to me is so, um, it's out of place. It sits in, a, in one of their, I forget what they call it. Um, I guess it's the bylaws. And it, it's in a section where they're uh, writing about managed care. And they mention as a, a conglomeration of things about managed care that, um, you know, they also afford, so they also oppose a single payer system. Um, I don't know. It, to me, it sounds like they don't really know what they mean by a single payer system in that, in the um, wording. And that's the only place I could find it. I, I actually talked to uh, the former president of the medical society who happens to be a personal friend of mine who is pretty conservative, uh, is definitely a Republican. Um, and he, he indicated, I've had more than one conversation with him. He indicated that, oh, the medical society isn't concerned with that. We have way more important things to do to fight for the rights of doctors. And, um, I think that there's a disconnect between the delegates and some of the officers, the way our society, I really don't know because I haven't been active in the society. Um, and he seemed very confused even as just, I mean, he was president. Oh, I think he's been not president for a year. Um, he seemed very confused as to even how to present a, a, a resolution. So I don't know. Well, it seems to me that, that managed care and single payer are the opposite as far as right. how they affect physicians and to confuse them is just really mixed up. I, I don't, um, I mean, Donald, don't you think that that wording at what is it 165.997 is the, the line where it exists? Yeah, it's all about like talking about concentrating um, the powers of payers versus uh, physicians and stuff. And then the, the single pair thing is just kind of lumped in there. It, it, and it, it really, I don't even think it says single payer per uh, government or, and I don't know, it's, it almost may, I mean, as I had said to you before, why don't we do, why don't we resolve to support single payer? Because that is such a wonky resolution, uh, whatever you call it. Um, I forget what they call their their by. It's not a bylaw per se, but that's that gets into, you know, some knowledge of what the society is up to that I just don't have. And unless, you know, I try to get more active, I think the students seem to be an easier um, sell. You know, as the PNHP literature says, most of the medical students support single payer. Um, so, well, I, I'm sure a lot of the people, the doctors who are opposed to single payer, imagine it means government intrusion in medical decision making, mm -hmm. which is what they're used to from insurance companies. Right, that's what managed but, care is. But certainly, what PNHP is proposing is the opposite of that. It's getting rid of the interference in medical decision making right. and empowering doctors to do what we're trained to do. Right. And, and, and there's nothing in it allowing government to micromanage medical decision making. I mean, so the presenting resolutions is one thing, but getting a forum um, in the group, uh, you know, it, it seems like it's another whole um, 
thing that we would need to do, assuming, I don't know, I mean, maybe the, maybe the resolution that the students put forth will, will get a favorable vote. I, I really don't know. It would be nice if there is an opportunity to explain what it is and right. what we're talking about and how it's different from what you may have heard and stuff like that in a way that would be uh, spread to the membership. I don't know how, how you could arrange that. Donald, you said they, they didn't have any hearings that that was because of COVID last year? Yeah, so last year with the, the virtual meeting, they didn't, um, they didn't allow, they didn't have it set up to have like, uh, you know, uh, testimonials and stuff. And um, that's still up in the air this year. It's going to be a virtual meeting again. Mm -hmm. um, but they haven't made a decision as to whether or not they'll allow uh, like virtual testimony. I will say that in the case of my resolution, having the opportunity to explain it was critical to its success. Otherwise, it would never right. have happened. Sure. Well, I can communicate back with the um, the lead on the women's section, um, and uh, you know, I I also the the my my friend who was the former president connected me with a staffer who's brand new and, and really didn't know anything about how the whole resolution process worked either, but she was willing to, you know, start learning and, and I can communicate with her, uh, but, you know, I don't, and I think I'll also send it over to the Allegheny County section um, delegate or delegates, um, but we, it, it has to go in by August 1st or 2nd which is next week, <laughs> so. Might be working on something for next year. Did any of the others of you that just came in have questions? Hello. I, uh, I didn't quite know what to expect. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I, I was uh, sent uh, this invitation by my, um, my chapter, New York Metro. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't come in with a big plan for what I wanted to ask about. But um, I'm board certified in internal medicine and also um, I'm board eligible for preventive medicine. So I'm um, just listening to everyone talk. I'm thinking about taking this to the American uh, College of Preventive Medicine which um, does not have a position on, um, I, don't, I don't, I think universal um, healthcare, but not, but absolutely not um, on single payer. And so um, I, you know, wh where would be a good, a good place to start? I don't feel like, I, I feel like they um, don't have as much of a, a formal governance structure and um, instead they have uh, representation in the AMA, but I haven't seen a lot of opportunities to um, propose um, uh, resolutions directly to a smaller college like that. I, I, I said a little about what happened with me in Hawaii uh, before you came on, but um, I was, I've been interested in single payer for a long time. I joined PNHP in 1989. And I've had uh, I've been following the health policy literature for a while, so yeah, Hawaii Medical Association in the um, uh, first decade of the 2000s uh, was dominated by Republican leadership, and, um, and to the point that a lot of members who were uh, more progressive quit, and our membership was shrinking. And um, I just. I said, what the heck? And I submitted a resolution supporting single payer. Uh, we didn't have anything in the Hawaii bylaws saying we can't do that. Um, and I was asked to uh, come in and explain my resolution and defend it and, and answer questions and things like that to the Hawaii Medical Association Council in the spring of 2009, and, um, which I did. And they asked good questions and I answered them the best I could. And then to my amazement, they passed it like 13 to four, <laughs> uh, which I didn't expect at all. And then I got my arm twisted to get involved in HMA leadership. And then I got elected treasurer and then president in 2012. Um, and incidentally, it, 
uh, the inauguration ball uh, when I got installed as president, the president of the AMA, who was, um, uh, uh, what's his name? He's a psychiatrist from Denver. Um, Jeremy Lazarus, yeah. He's the one that installed me and he told me we were sitting at the same table and he told me he actually supported single payer but he couldn't admit it as president of AMA. <laughs> so I, it, to me, it was, it was just a series of surprises uh, that I did not expect. Um, but I, th I think the opportunity to explain it and answer questions was crucial to the success because we we're just talking about how generally the opposition to single payer comes from doctors who assume it means government interference in medical decision making, which they're used to from the insurance companies, and they imagine government would only be bigger and worse. But what PNHP is proposing is anything but that. It would it would take the managed care people out of healthcare. It would re-empower doctors to be the ones making decisions along with their patients. And uh, you know, there's a big difference between what people imagine and what we're actually proposing. And you need an opportunity to explain that. Thank you. I also, I also said before you came on that some of my strongest support came from some Republican procedural specialists in ophthalmology and cardiology who said that you know they'd had their fees controlled forever by the largest insurance company here and going to single payer wouldn't be any different that way but what they were really interested in is getting their professional autonomy back and if that's what it meant they were willing to support it so Stephen, what year was it that they passed the resolution i submitted it in 2008 and was passed in 2009 has there been any um have there been any you know, proposals to uh, change it since then? No. Hmm. We had the next seven or eight Hawaii Medical Association presidents were all single payer supporters. Oh, wow. Hmm. So the whole leadership just flipped at that point. <laughs> And I'm sorry if you talked about this before I came on, but um, I get the impression from emails that I've gotten that this is more of a, this is a, an ongoing campaign with PNHP to have uh, members promote resolutions or put forth resolutions. And I'm just curious what um, resources are available, like if we have um, template language that we're sharing or um, other um, guides for members who are interested in um, taking this forward. Maybe uh, Claire would like to answer that question. Hey, yes, this is Caitlin Gilbert at the National Office. We sure do have resources for you. So I'm going to put in the chat the exact URL of the website, but it's medicareforallresolutions.org. We have sample language that's COVID updated. So you'll have all that. And the data is updated to 2018 statistics, I believe, or the most updated data we have. Um, we have a map of all the current resolutions ongoing. We have the verbiage from the Hawaii resolution as well as the past Vermont resolution. So we have resources for you. And then we also have staff that are willing to support you in your efforts. So um, you're not alone and this is possible. Donald, do you know when the vote is or the meet, the delegate meeting? Yeah, the delegate meeting is um, in October. I can't remember the exact oh, okay. date off my head, but yeah, sometime in October. Did you know personally, or personally some of the students in the student section? Um, just like through Zoom. Um, meeting over meetings and stuff yeah i mean the student the student body seems to support it yeah Hey everybody, this is Ken at PNHP. Uh, Judy and Donald, I had a couple of questions for you guys about the Pennsylvania effort. Um, so the 
so it, it sounds like so Donald's got a resolution that's coming forward through the student section. So I guess I, Judy, is there is there a need to try and submit a second resolution? Well, I, I mean. I kind of thought if there was more than one uh, delegate proposing the resolution, it might give strength to it. But you know, that's a you have a point there. Maybe, maybe it's not needed. Okay. I mean, I'm all for having. I mean, I think it's good. You know, to to be reaching out to new people for support. I was just, I just didn't understand if it was if it's necessary or if that's a. I don't. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I I haven't really been able to get a lot of specific information from people um, at the medical society about strategies. There's a, seems to be a bit of um, you know people don't know that much about it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, and do you know do you know how this is? Is this voted on in a general meeting? Like, what's the like, what's the mechanism? Like, what's the process that they approve this by? Is there just a voice vote of everyone who's or a, a tally of everyone who attends the virtual meeting? So, my understanding of how it works is that uh, there's delegates at the meeting who have voting rights. Mm. So each you know county has their own. Um, you know, section, there's a women's section, there's a student section. Um, each of them have, you know, X number of delegates who can vote. Um, and that's how it's passed, I believe, just to a simple majority of the delegates. Um, it's not open to a, uh, a general election of the, of the actual members. Okay, so we can't just like turn out all the Pennsylvania PNHP members to the the Zoom call and and swamp the vote. Is that? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think so. I think only delegates um, have voting rights. Okay, and that's my impression. But I I know only delegates can propose resolutions. If um, if we do allow uh, testimony, though, I'm pretty sure any. Uh, and provide so that would be helpful. Okay. I think these things vary from state to state. In Hawaii, any member can submit a resolution, but the voting was from the HMA uh, council who are, who are elected representatives. They're the ones that could vote. But anyone could submit a resolution. It may, it may depend on the state how it works. Yeah, and and is the list of delegates known? I, I believe so. I, I'm pretty sure that on the website you can find that out. But I'm going to go back to the staff person and see if. She's educated herself a little bit since I talked to her about a week ago um, and asked some of these questions. I mean, it, it, seemed, it just seemed to me that, and I don't know, Donald, if you know any more about this, but it seemed to me that it's almost like two separate entities. There's the Medical Society and there's the House of Delegates. And, um, I don't like the officers of the medical society are not automatically delegates when they're past president, um, at least according to my friend who's a past president. Um, I, I, I don't understand it. Yeah, I, I don't understand it that well either. <laughs> Typically delegates are uh, people that are interested in being involved in leadership at the national level and uh, are willing to go to meetings and pay for the travel and things like that. And they get reelected year after year um, and become, that's how they develop power in the AMA by being reelected repeatedly. People get to know them, they get on committees, they start moving their way up. Um, and that's separate from the officers that change every year or two. Hmm. 
but it, it is they are elected positions by the whole membership the delegates hmm. has anyone has there ever been a serious discussion about uh term limits because uh, there's a lot of gray hairs in the <laughs> in the house of delegates hmm. it, it's just like the uh the u.s senate and house of representatives that the longer you're in there the more power you get so if you have term limits you're restricting your power too so there's it, there's good and bad sides to it. But to your knowledge, uh, never a serious uh, debate on the subject. No. Well, and I assume that would be state by state. Um, not yeah. the same for every state. In New York, it's pretty bad scene. Misney was the only uh, state uh, chapter of the AMA to not endorse the ACA 11 years ago. The New York chapter? Yeah. Or New York state? Hmm. Yeah. Alabama, Mississippi, yes. New York, no. Wow. Wow. That's surprising. Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, say a word. This is uh, Joe Eusterman from the uh, Oregon PNHP uh, chapter. Um, recently, uh, our chapter decided to uh, put out a memo of support for the uh, New York Metro PNHP uh, and in their effort to uh, get the uh, New York Senate and Assembly to pass a single payer program uh, under the New York Health Act. Um, and I've been working with uh, Mandy uh, from the New York Metro group. And uh, we have completed the language on that and uh, and Mandy says they will they're kind of shut things down now for the rest of the summer, but they'll be taking up the issue again in the fall or next early next year. And they'll be using our memo of support from the Oregon chapter to try to get the assembly and the Senate in New York to pass. Uh, the New York Health Act, which they failed to vote on uh, recently, which was you know, quite a disappointment to many of us because New York was so close, uh, was so close to getting uh, the New York Health Act passed. So we here in Oregon, even though we would love to be number one, getting single payer uh, passed in for all Oregonians. We have our health care for all Oregon group, uh, which is also very strong. But in any case, uh, I just wanted to let this particular group that's involved in this webinar right now to know about that effort. And perhaps other states might want to, cons other state chapters of PNHP might want to consider doing the same thing to support New York Metro. Uh, getting uh, single payer passed under the New York Health Act. Hope that makes some sense. New York uh, New York Metro has an excellent template uh, that they offer to groups that want to express support uh, for their efforts in getting a new New York Health Act passed. So we just. Uh, put in our information uh, and Mandy's going to be uh, publicizing that support from Oregon uh, later this year or early next year. FYI. <laughs> Thanks. New York, uh, the <coughs> excuse me, the bill had um, the majority of 
assembly persons as co-sponsors and the majority of senators as co-sponsors, but the caucus as a whole uh, could not quote unquote reach consensus on what the final bill should look like. So we, we had the numbers nominally, but we didn't, it didn't come for a vote. Yeah, it was kind of really kind of amazing uh, that it didn't come to a vote. Particularly, I, it's, my honest, it's my understanding that both uh, the Democrats were in the majority in both the Assembly and the Senate. Yeah, so, not just the majority, but actually co-sponsors of the bill represented uh, uh, a majority in uh, both houses, I believe. Dr. Kimball, I have a question um, real quickly. You know, you are a, you're a major leader in your medical society. And so I know you're probably not, uh, you're, you're very familiar with the idea of having organizing conversations with people or one-on-one -on -one conversations with people talking about policy and, you know, as a chapter leader as well in PNHP. I'm wondering, you know, especially advice for Judy and Donald as they're moving forward and trying to figure out what delegates would be supportive. What sort of advice do you have for folks um, as they go into these conversations? What do you think physicians need to hear to feel empowered to support a resolution, especially if there might not be initial support in general? Well, I, I think you need to find out what their concerns about single payer are, because they're almost always based on misunderstandings and misinformation and, and, and a, a blatantly inaccurate concept of what it is and then explain what PNHP is talking about, which is not what they're worried about. Uh, I think that's, that's the, the, the main thing I would, I would say. Um, it's, I mean, it's a very complex subject and it's often difficult to break it down into something that can be explained simply and briefly. Uh, and that comes with practice. <laughs> you know, the more you do it, the better you get at it. But, um, it's really disabusing people of their false assumptions. Because uh, I, th I think every medical society wants to support physicians to be able to do what they're trained to do in taking care of their patients. So they all agree to that no matter where they're on the political spectrum, but they assume that single payer would undermine that when actually it would completely support it. I I, this is Joe Eusterman again. I, I have pretty consistently referred people to the Q&A uh, information on the PNHP website, you know, which I think is, is, has, has evolved over time is really excellent, excellent information. And uh, people have actually gone to that site and that link. And, uh, and they get back to me and they say, wow, I didn't, I didn't know I didn't know this. This is this is really helpful. So I just want to suggest that uh, that we use that that link more to spread the word about single payer and what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, a, another uh, thought that that was actually communicated to me by my friend, the former president, uh, is that. The, the other thing that they're really interested in is boosting their membership numbers. And I know, you know, amongst many of my colleagues, <clears throat> people, I mean, I let mine, I let mine lapse after I retired because I had no interest in, in, you know, what I had seen their goals up until that point. Um, and, you know, because it had largely been like um, Stephen said, a, you know, conservative, organization um but that and it, when i was telling him about the resolution and and pnhp and the usual you know we're a group of twenty thousand physicians um he he latched right onto that idea and so maybe an idea is you might be able to have more you might gain more membership if you supported things that mattered to physicians more especially younger physicians um which I think we have pretty good evidence. Um, and yet I, I, I would guess uh, that medical students aren't flocking to join the AMA or the, the medical society. 
statement. Along, along those lines, I think a, a, a useful piece of information is that in Canada, which has a single payer system, membership in the medical society is required and they have collective negotiation of fees. Hmm. So the medical society negotiates with the government what the fees will be. Oh, wow. And they have significant power in that process which is not true in the United States where the your insurance companies unilaterally set your fees and you have no say in it whatsoever. Right. Uh, and, um, and it's required membership. So they would instantly get, if we did the same thing as Canada, the AMA or, or some new version of the AMA would instantly get all, all licensed physicians. And they could lower their dues substantially because they'd be spreading them across a much bigger membership. Right. Yeah, that's an excellent point. This year in the MISNI House of Delegates, uh, I offered two resolutions. And the, the resolutions came out of discussions with Richard Godfrey, who is the principal author of the New York Health Act. Uh, I've always been struck when I uh, heard Richard uh, speak and when I've had a chance to talk to him myself that he uh, quite is quite careful about uh, demonizing the corporate insurance industry when he's certainly when he's speaking in public um, <clears throat> and he emphasizes the point that they have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profits at the expense of patients. Uh, so the resolution uh, we crafted for MISNI, hopefully will also be referred to the AMA if it is supported, um, chronicles physician grievances against corporate insurance companies. How many times have they debated and passed a resolution about the problem of prior authorization. How many times have they passed resolutions about compensation for the appeal process, for fairness in the appeal process? Uh, how many times have they debated um, the uh, the changing of formularies in the middle of a fiscal cycle. Uh, so suddenly a patient's medication is no longer uh, covered. And the resolution concludes with the fact that these things are worthwhile, um, that we've been whining about them for a long time without any tangible results. And then finally, they're, they, they're a violation of our oath and uh, our code of professional conduct. Um, and the, the resolved is basically says, you know, let's relieve those, the corporate insurance industry of its fiduciary duty to act immorally hmm. by supporting the New York Health Act and the Medicare for All. You know, um, one of my uh, favorite policy points is that I really think that the root cause of most of our problems is the competitive insurance business model. And the reason it's a problem is because insurance is designed to manage financial risks that are infrequent, expensive, and unpredictable. And if a risk, risk meets all three of those criteria, like lightning striking your house and having it burned down, uh, then they use risk pooling to manage the risk, which is what we're looking for. That's the positive side of insurance. But when the risk is largely predictable, which it is in healthcare because of pre-existing conditions, demographics, and social determinants of health, a huge amount of the risk is predictable. Then the motivation for the, the driver of competition, the incentive is to avoid risk, which is to undermine Healthcare. So we, we have a system for paying for healthcare that is stacked against delivery of healthcare, which is crazy. It's utterly crazy. Uh, you know, we're, we're the frog in the boiling pot. You know, we've been in it so long, we haven't realized how crazy it is. 
but we would never have jumped in this pot if we knew where it was going. <laughs> it's just nuts. And uh, social insurance, which is what single payer is, means everyone's in one risk pool. There is no risk avoidance. Uh, we just pool everyone and spread it across the whole population. And that's the, by far the most cost-effective way to manage the variability and unpredictability in healthcare costs. Costs way less to administer, and it doesn't have any perverse incentives in it. And it's crazy to do otherwise. It's crazy. Yeah, the, the another way of of saying it doesn't have the perverse incentives is that it actually allows market forces to function the way they're supposed to, as opposed to the competitive system, which distorts market forces, you know, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, there, there, there's, there, the, I think the biggest problem in our system is a lack of a very important incentive, and that is to keep people healthy. Yeah. The competitive insurance industry has no interest in whether any of us have a, an MI the day after our 65th birthday. It's a money extraction system. Yeah. It's, it's fundamentally parasitic to healthcare. It's good. In, incidentally, the New York Health Act needs to have a flaw fix because it supports competing ACOs and HMOs. And that reintroduces the competitive insurance business model in a supposedly single payer system and it makes it into a multi payer system. You got to get rid of that. <laughs> Follow Jayapal's HR 1976, which bans those things. The um, 1976 allows a, a, a Kaiser-like entity to have a physician group, get paid through a hospital's, an individual hospital's global operating budget that includes the physician salaries, uh, but it eliminates the insurance function. So there's no members, there's no closed panels. Anyone can uh, go to a Kaiser doctor group and hospital for care and also go somewhere else and they're not out of network and they don't get surprise bills. Uh, so you keep all the good things about Kaiser and get rid of the insurance function. Uh, Stephen, this is Joe Eusterman again. I'd, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on um, uh, succeeding with single payer in a, in a state and then hoping that it spreads to the nation, which is very less we would do as happened in Canada. Uh, are, 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 you, are you sympathetic to that approach uh, to getting single payer for the country? Uh, and also, uh, just uh, we, our, our Oregon chapter officers recently wrote, to, uh, wrote a letter to uh, Senator Wyden uh, asking him to uh, introduce a super waiver uh, to uh, deal with the ERISA problem. Um, what are, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on those subjects. Well, I, I'm um, pushing for single payer at both the national and the state level, and, and I see those as entirely complementary. I don't know where the breaks are going to be, um, and we should be pushing on all fronts and looking for any opportunities we can find. Um, and I think the, the biggest obstacle by far is the, the money and power of the insurance industry. So demonizing the insurance business model is fundamental to success. And if you don't do that, if you try to expand coverage without evicting the insurance system first, what you do is you end up with the Affordable Care Act, which has huge holes in it. Uh, an insurance policy with a six, seven, eight thousand dollar deductible and large and you know 40 percent co-pays means you're paying all this money and it's expensive for something that does you no good when you're actually sick because you have to spend your own money on it anyway. And and that's the craziness you come up with if you don't get rid of the insurance business model first. So I think demonizing insurance is fundamentally critical to success. Um, in Hawaii we the same year that my resolution got adopted by HMA, the legislature passed a bill to create the Hawaii Health Authority, which is supposed to be responsible for overall health policy and steer Hawaii to a universal system covering everyone in the state. And that is in Hawaii law. And what happened is 
we passed it and thought, okay, great, now let's get to work. I ended up being appointed to it as one of the original members, uh, which didn't happen until two years later in 2011. But uh, at the same time, the Affordable Care Act passed, which is built around the insurance business model. And uh, our then governor wanted to, he was a, a friend of Obama's parents when Obama was born. He was a co-sponsor of HR 676 when he was our representative in Congress. When he became governor, he pivoted to implement the Affordable Care Act, threw us under the bus, took our funding away and ignored everything we said and turned it all over to the insurance companies. And he had a new initiative to implement Obamacare, which wasn't in his budget. So he got money from the insurance companies to implement it. And I was appointed to all the key committees as a member of the Hawaii Health Authority. And everything I said got ignored. It was left out of the minutes. Uh, they just ran through whatever the insurance companies wanted and ignored all the frontline physicians, community health workers, anyone who was actually dealing with patients on the front lines got ignored. Anything they said was left out of the minutes. It was, it was appalling. So th there you go. You know, you pass a law that's supposed to put you on the path to single payer and the insurance companies have not been evicted and they just sabotage it. Very interesting. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I agree that we should be pushing on every front that we can at the state level, at the federal level. The biggest obstacle at the state level um, is, well, I guess it's easier to start with the federal level. Um, however, the finances are shifted and clearly single payer is a fiscally conservative approach uh, to healthcare much more efficient than the current system. But the increase in federal expenditures that would create and, and bring us that efficiency um, is a substantial chunk of money and the federal government has a massive military industrial complex that it's very easy to hide a half a trillion or even a trillion dollars behind. Um, in New York, uh, I have very liberal friends who are concerned about the tax implications of the New York Health Act, which would effectively double tax receipts um, in New York State. And, um, you know, the, the state of New York just doesn't have a defense budget that it can tuck the New York Health Act behind. So it's, it's much more in your face. And that may be a significant problem, uh, reason why it didn't come up for a vote. This year. Well, the question I asked is, would you rather pay a uh, thousand a month in premiums or 800 a month in taxes, yeah. uh, which is basically what we're talking about. Yeah. And yeah. The financing thing that, you know, even the best um, cost estimates of single payer don't come anywhere close to matching the actual results in other countries. So there's something that they're missing. There's, there's large hidden costs that are, are like, for example, the Affordable Care Act, after they passed, Obama administration negotiated with the insurance industry to reclassify medical management as healthcare instead of administration. And medical management is, started out being things like utilization review and trying to assure appropriate utilization but it got expanded to mean anything the insurance companies claim is going to improve quality or coordination of care and reduce costs. And it doesn't matter if what they do actually has the opposite effects. As long as they claim that's the goal, they get to move it into the healthcare column. So since then, it, hidden administrative costs have ballooned because they're getting counted as healthcare. And and that, that's not all money going to doctors and hospitals, it's um, money going to administer these payment reforms. Uh, I know that um, I actually was on the board of a smaller insurance plan that was run by physicians at the time. And our medical management, we did very judicious medical management. We only managed things that were really worth managing. And our, that was 1.5% of our budget. And since then, and that got immediately shifted to the uh, healthcare column, of course. 
the major dominant insurance plan here was also fairly judicious, maybe a little more than, than us, but um, you know, I would guess it was in 1.5 to 2% range. But since then, they've piled on administrative burdens in the name of payment reform and value-based payment. All doctors agree their administrative burdens and costs have gone up. Obviously, HMSA is spending a lot more money, and they're claiming their administrative costs have gone down since then, which is unbelievable. Their premiums have doubled, and they're claiming their administrative costs have gone down. I mean, there's major shenanigans involved in this. Our push right now is to try to persuade Hawaii Medicaid and Hawaii um, government employee unions, their Medicare Medical Trust Fund, to eliminate the competitive insurance business model, take these back as self-insured programs, use a much more simplified, streamlined payment system that's administratively much less expensive to run and show that we can demonstrate savings. Once we've kicked the insurance companies out, then we can talk about expanding them to the rest of the population. And those two things are under state control, Medicaid and employee benefits, they're under state control. And they're a big chunk of the market. Folks, we're getting into within the last 10 minutes of Dr. Kemble's time. So this is a really good opportunity to ask any quick fire questions you have with him um, regarding your resolutions, um, next steps moving forward. Um, but as a preemptive, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kimball, for being on today and everyone coming in with your good questions. But again, we have nine more minutes, so let's let's hear what the audience has to say. May I send my resolutions along uh, and hope for any feedback you can when I give testimony in REFCOM and on the House? Please do. I'll put my email in the chat, um, and Dr. Kimball, if you're interested in reviewing as well, but I know I definitely want to review and help you in any way. And I actually have an email draft uh, that I want to send to you, Larry. So maybe I'll reach, I'll reach out to you first and you can respond with your verbiage. Thank you so much. I don't, I, maybe it was you, Caitlin, that put the, um, the website info from the PA Met Medical Society that seems to indicate that you can send in some written testimony um, if I interpret that correctly. So uh, I will look into that. Thanks to Stephen for all of the um, experiences that you had. That was very helpful. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to sign off. Thanks for organizing it, Caitlin. Okay. Okay. Any other last comments or questions? I think you filled them with so much knowledge. Um, this was a really great call, and I think I'll end it early for us if we have no more questions. Um, but you can always email me, everyone, at caitlin at pnhp.org that I'm putting in the chat. Um, and if you need connections or any further questions answered, I'm happy to help. Uh, but again, thank you, Dr. Kimball, for being here. 
Um, and thank you for putting your email in the chat. Um, I'll give folks the second to copy that if they need it. And we'll be ending early. Look at us. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.